Welcome to the Final Frontiers radio show, where we spotlight inspiring missionary endeavors around the globe. Stay tuned to hear how you can personally get involved helping the Lord's frontline soldiers effectively advance the gospel where it has never been preached before. In this episode, we have Morgan Jackson back with us with more exciting testimonies from Faith Comes by Hearing. We'll also have another debriefing interview about traveling to the city of Bodhgaya, where Buddhism was birthed. And we'll have a testimony of a national preacher from Kenya, Africa. Hi, this is John Nelms, and I'm here today with Morgan Jackson, who is the president of a ministry called Faith Comes by Hearing. And this is a ministry that produces audio Bibles, and we wanted him to be on air with us today so he can share his ministry with us. So as I've used your app and your program around the world, I don't know how many languages we've used your material in, but it looks like we've got a ways to go if it's 1,145 of them. But there's two things that have always stood out to me that I've heard you say, but I've seen it and heard it with my own eyes so many times. And that is, one, people will say that they heard God speaking their language. Yep. And that just absolutely amazes them, and rightfully so. Uh, and then the second thing, I always try to watch it when this happens. As soon as a woman's voice comes on, like the woman at the well or Mary or whoever, and you all have a woman playing that part, so it's a woman's voice in your Bible. Oh, my goodness, that gets the attention of all the women and the little girls. It's just incredible. Uh, you, yep. you all, God really blessed you with a lot of wisdom when it came to putting this thing together. My dad was in India, and he was with somebody, and they were playing a section of Scripture that had women in it. And after the listening time, they would have a time of question and discussion. And both men and women participated. Then he went to, they were listening, and no women participated in two villages. And finally, my dad said, what's going on? He said, and so he asked them what was happening. And they said, well, we personally got bored with that section of scripture. So we went to a section of scripture where there were no voices of women. And my dad called our team and said, every place you can have a woman, where it's a question whether it's a woman or a man, put a woman. Because when women hear women, Jesus talking to women, because in so many cultures, women are seen as not valuable, as possessions, even in Islam, almost like animals. When they hear Jesus addressing, touching, talking to women respectfully, even when the woman with the issue of blood touches him, in any other culture, she should have been beaten or killed. And it's the only time that you see, I mean, in the history of the world, something unclean that touches something clean makes it unclean. Hmm. But not then. When a woman with the issue about touched Jesus, he made her clean. And that story is one of the most powerful stories around the world. I'll see it acted out in village after village. They will play that story with a woman crawling behind a group of men trying to get in to touch Jesus. And when he she touches him, Jesus saying, who touched me? And people, when they're in a listening group, will cry out in fear because they think he's going to rebuke them. <laughs> who touched me? And they'll cry out. And when he says, a woman, thy faith has made you well, you watch people sob and sob. My heart hurts. My heart hurts. Why does my heart hurt? Yeah. And the pastors will say, Jesus has walked by you. That's why your heart hurts. <laughs> He's walked by you, but we don't understand. You know it from Latin America. You go to Latin America. When I was in Peru, I was going to village by village, and everywhere people were saying, when they heard Bible in their own language, they would weep and cry and say, my heart hurts, my heart hurts, why does my heart hurt? The story was the woman with the issue of blood. And Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out why that story. People are coming to faith through that story. I didn't understand it. And after seven communities and and I'm saying, well, what questions to ask? Can we hear the story again? Why does my heart hurt? And I'm calling out to the Lord saying, what's going on here? And the Lord reminded me of the words of Romulo Sanye from Peru, a Quechua Indian, where he had told me, Morgan, you know, when we fled the mountains from the Shining Path, we were in Lima, but we had no churches. We'd go to the Spanish churches. Can we use your church on a Tuesday or an evening? And we were told, well, you're animals. You have bugs, diseases. No, and they drive us out of the church. The Bolivian Bible Society had explained to me that for 500 years, the Spanish had dominated Latin America. And it wasn't until 1965 that it had been ruled by the Catholic Church that the Indians of Latin America had a soul. 
So previous to that, if you killed oh. an Indian, it was a crime, but it was not murder because you had not killed a human being. You had killed an animal. And so all of a sudden I had read this study that shows that when oral people hear something in their language, a story, they can't separate themselves. They literally enter the story and it becomes as real for them as if it was happening at that moment. And if they identify with somebody in the story without thinking, they'll join that person. So in these indigenous communities throughout Latin America, when you bring the word of God in, when they get to Mark 5, hope has been birthed in their heart because God speaks their language. Jesus has been healing people, casting out demons. And when the woman with the issue of blood begins to crawl and try to get through the crowd to get to Jesus without thinking, they join that woman. And when she touches, they touch, and something happens inside them. And when Jesus says, who touched me, they turn and they are terrified. They have made a mistake. What is he going to say? They get shocked. We've used some of your equipment, too, the Proclaimer specifically, for quite some time. And in the last year or so, my son Daniel, who you met, has developed some similar things, but much, much smaller, almost for, like, personal use. They're, like, one-inch square. We have them made in China, but each one of them has your Bible put in there. We've worked this out with your staff to make sure we did it all correctly. But I just wanted you to know we've targeted several unreached tribal groups in South America. And uh, we've developed enough that we can give one to every single family in that tribal group. And we have Indian preachers down there who know these tribes and get in there with them. They've found where their villages are, determined how many households are in each village and so forth. So as much as you guys are accomplishing on your own, you're accomplishing even more through ministries like ours who are blessed to be able to use your product. And I want to thank you for that. Earlier, when we first started talking, you mentioned the uh, app you have. What was the name of it again? Called Bible.is. So Bible, period, is. It's a free app and allows you to listen to the Bible in English. Mm -hmm. So when you open up Bible, it's select an English version or Spanish version first. Once you're there, you can hear the scriptures dramatized. But then you can go and find any other language by touching Bibles up in the upper right-hand corner. There's a drop-down. Mm-hmm. There's three searches, version, language, country. I never search by language because there's 1,376 languages. So I search by country because then when I'm talking to somebody, I'll say, hey, what country are you from? Peru. Click. Pull it up. There's 35 languages. Okay. You speak Quechua. Yeah, oh, there's 28 Quechua languages. Oh, my. Which Quechua language do you speak? Oh, Quechua Ayacucho. Okay, click. They hear it. Oh, do you want it? Yes. Then I can just go up to that little share button, click, get their cell phone or their email, click. They've got the link, and they immediately have it. And so if you're going on a mission trip or you want to know, does faith come by hearing, have this language? The Bible is, is your easiest mission tool to say, what do they have? And then before you go... There's a download, so on the left hand, when you drop down, there's downloads. So I can download uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or even just one book of that language. So when I'm out in the villages or the jungle, it doesn't matter that I'm not connected. I can just play it, and they can listen to it. That's a great idea. And so that's a tool. And also tell Daniel that we now have Global Bible Apps, which is an app that transfers phone to phone. So what it does is it allows the app and the whole Audio New Testament actually to be put on an Android phone and then shared phone to phone. Every phone communicates with the phones around it. So even when you're not connected to the Internet or Wi-Fi, the phone can actually transfer that full New Testament 24-hour file to another phone. And so all you have to do is take in a few micro SD cards, put them in people's phones with that app, and you can just ask our team to create it for you. And then they can transfer any phone that's a smartphone. As you know, they'll have no shoes, no bathroom, but they'll have an Android phone in their back (laughs) pocket. Allows them then to share it with anybody else, even though they don't have an internet or cellular connection. That is fantastic, Morgan. I hope you all keep creating and developing. And if I might speak on behalf of the body of Christ worldwide, I want to thank you and your staff for everything you all have done to help get the knowledge of Christ out there. And for the no doubt untold millions and millions that will come to Christ as a result of your work. Hope God will bless you and keep you all in great health and give you all the wisdom and discernment, everything you need to just keep doing more and more and more. God bless you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. So appreciate it. Give your son my greetings. All right, I will. Glad we can help you. Thank you, brother. Have a wonderful day. 
Have you ever wished you could help broken-hearted widows and orphans suffering in third-world countries? What about being an encouragement to persecuted Christian families in the Middle East? With our Bags of Hope food distribution program, you can make an impact on the saved and the lost by helping supply food, clean water, vitamins and medicine, literally helping distribute real, physical Bags of Hope to needy families. To learn more, visit us at FinalFrontiers.world. Now we'll have part two of the India debriefing with stories from the birthplace of Buddhism. So Bodh Gaya, it's the birthplace of Buddhism, literally. Mm. And it is where Buddha woke up under the Bodhi tree and experienced enlightenment or nirvana. Right. And then Baranasi is technically, you could call it Shiva's city. Oh. And so it's very important. Now, I'm leaving from Howrah Station on the train... <laughs> And it can get extremely confusing in some of those train stations. Howrah, like I said, is one of the absolute biggest. And so you have line after line after line. You have, no joke, thousands and thousands of people you're rubbing shoulders with every day. They're coming off the trains. They're getting on the trains. There's people sleeping all over the floor. You've got every shade of people there, right. every kind of cast. And they're all just, just moving through that, that whole place. I mean, I saw people laying on the streets outside uh, that were just half dead. I sent a picture, I tried to upload it while I was there, just telling people, this is what you see in India. I saw people walking in front of me that were just completely in a loincloth rags, literally rags, just dangling off the guy. And people so poor that it's it's unbelievable. Yeah. Really? And it was like that around Calcutta, you know, just, just walking around. Um, you, you, see, you see kids on the street, and just right there on the main street, they're just living with a couple of pans and very dirty conditions and something slightly maybe to shelter themselves and that's where they live all the time right <clears throat> but I actually missed a train <laughs> um, when I was there I missed the train and it doesn't cost a whole lot but still it's a it it's a makes you feel sick it's like <laughs> you're running with your bags trying to get you find out that it's on the wrong st- uh, track and and oh, so it's come yeah. in on a different a different platform and so you're like running around trying to find the right platform <laughs> and then you see it leaving just as you're running up to it you know the train's gone and i had to wait around and i figured out that Howard station pretty good i had to, I had hours and hours, but then I found out that not too far away, I could get to probably the main temple in Calcutta, the Kali Ma. Right. And so to be able to actually visit that, I thought, I'm going to Shiva's city. This is Kali's city. Sure. And you can hear all kinds of wild stories about Kali there, and they'll try to tell you that there are no sacrifices still going on, but there are. <laughs> sacrifices, blood sacrifices still go on. Uh, they, I, I went ahead, I traveled there, I thought this would be really good, now I'm focusing on Hinduism. And I thought, let's get there. So I managed to find a guy that would take me in, it was rainstorming really bad, and he took me into the temple, but I was not allowed to take pictures. So I went in, and they have uh, red hibiscus flowers, they say, Kali loves red hibiscus. And he took me all around the main temple on the inside, and you have people going around on these steel catwalks, And it'll take three hours just for them to catch a glimpse of the god. And if you're in a festival or if you're in the main temple for a god, then for you to lock eyes with it is very important. And they believe that they'll have that blessing or whatever they're praying for when they offer Mm -hmm. because they believe that the, the god, the deity itself, will come and inhabit that statue when they have prayed for that. Right. So especially if it's a festival, they'll parade it through the streets. If you can just see the eyes of it, then they believe that God sees you and you see him. And so people will go for three hours just to lay just their garlands down. down. Yeah. Right. So he took me around. I saw the goats. He said, here's the goats that we use for sacrifice. And then right over to the side is, is where they're slaughtering them and they're getting the meat ready. And they actually give it to the poor people now. That's what they do. Oh. And then he showed me where they lop the heads off just right around the corner to Kali. And this is blood. this is where it was, yeah. You catch the blood, and all of this they they take they slaughter them there, and then they they do the rest in the other area. But mm-hmm. he took me all the way around through this little tiny spot where you squeeze through, and he wanted me to see the god, and and so you you squeeze all the way down in there. There's even a lady with a with a chair, and she's trying to squeeze through there like a walker, and just everybody under the sun trying to get in, and you do your little puja and get your red dot. And people were trying to get in there to do that. But he allowed me to get in this tiny little spot where we're squeezing in with people because he wanted me to catch a glimpse. And he even yelled out, and everybody cleared for just a second so the <laughs> tourist could see without going for three hours. 
Oh. Uh, so, <laughs> so I had my own little tour guide here that I had to kind of go with, and once in a while I had to, you have to do that. Right. But he took me over to another Shiva statue, and, and he said, here, you can take a picture of the temple from here. So I went to the main Kali, Kali Ma, Kali Ghat temple, and uh, made it back to the train station and got out of there, and the goal was to get all the way to Bodh Gaya on the train. And that's, it's a different feeling you know, when you get into, when you go from Hinduism to Buddhism. And there's still a lot of Hindus that live in Bodh Gaya. But this is the place where Buddha, the, the Cave of Enlightenment is there, which I got to visit and I did not even know existed at the, in that area. Sure. But he comes down out of the cave after like six years and he crosses the river. And there's a special tree there. There's a special village uh, where he first ate with Sujata, this lady who gives him food for the first time. This is the six this years is, he spent in the cave that yeah, didn't eat? Yeah, so well, time. first of all, see, you don't know about all this. This is out in the countryside. Yeah. But he crosses that river and he comes in and then he gets under this one tree. And this is the tree of enlightenment. And supposedly a huge spiritual battle was fought there and everything in, in him. And then he achieved this, uh, this Buddhahood, really. And he achieved enlightenment, became the enlightened one or the Buddha. And so this is where the whole religion started. And, you know, and Buddha never said, I'm a god. Right. He was trying to help them realize that there was no god, <laughs> right. that, that it's all just nothingness. And Hinduism kind of goes back to that in the end, too. Yeah. But Buddhism came out of that. He couldn't, is. It's he couldn't find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've got different names for it in, in different religions. But, yeah, Buddhism, to be able to attain that, to have peace in that. And so he found his enlightenment. The tree is there. And so you can go to the temple, Mahabodhi Temple, the biggest one. You can see it for miles. I mean, it's huge pinnacle. But every other nation in the world who believes in Buddhism has a temple there. Yeah. And so what, that's, I didn't realize that. You get into town. I got in really late, uh, got off the platform, got somebody to take me into Bodh Gaya from Gaya. You, you have to, the train goes by Gaya. So it was really late at night, getting on the streets, um, trying to find a place to stay. And, and then the next day, then, I went around and went to some of the temples that are nearby. So you get to experience and see um, what every culture believes about it. And, and the temples, the statues, it's very different. I mean, you, you might have one from, um, from China. You might have one from Cambodia. Then one from Bhutan. One from Tibet, Nepal. You know, just Buddhism all over the world. They all get to put their two cents in. Huh. And some of these statues are gigantic. Some of them, like there's, I think the Thailand one is like a 70 foot, 80 foot statue right. of Buddha. And this is a different kind of Buddhism than sometimes what you see in America, where you see this this very large, well endowed Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> you the you're seeing, head. yeah, it's happy, happy Buddha. Yeah, happy Buddha, right head for like, yeah. Yeah, this is this is very different. Yeah. And it's more of a he, he's he's skinny, more of a skinny Buddha. Yeah. yeah which I experienced once when I was in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. So, and Bhutan has a has a, a neat temple there for themselves. But I met someone while I was there. I was really praying for, for a good guide. And I found a guy who was younger. He's got his own motorcycle. And he said, do you know the three most important things in Bodh Gaya? And I had studied and tried to find out what I needed to see, but I only figured I'd be there for a few hours. Mm -hmm. So he, he takes me out. I managed, I found out I could trust this guy. And he's more of a college student. He's trying to earn some extra money, but he's very, very knowledgeable. And so he took me out of town on his motorcycle. If you don't have a motorcycle, we couldn't get to where the places that I would like to go. Right. And, and he said, you know what? I'll do this cheaper for you than normal taxis and everything. And I was starting to find out how much things were. So he takes me all the way out. And we, go, we run up the mountain and get to see the place of uh, the, the cave where Buddha was in. And it's on the off season. It's too hot. So mm -hmm. nobody comes. Oh. And so I get to go in there, go inside the cave, no and kidding. nobody was there except monkeys. They didn't have the thing roped off, you know, by <laughs> no, the glass? No, no. They, <clears throat> and, and, you know, during the good season, not, that's not the off season, it's packed with people. Okay. So this time it was just me and him. I could have filmed anything I wanted there. Wow. And you, you come up and it's just the side of the wall. They've got it all covered. And then it used to be a deep pit with water in the bottom. They cemented it over. And they just show you where he was in the cave. So there's a statue in there of this skeletal-looking Buddha huh. where he stayed. They believe that he was there for six years and never drank or ate anything. And everybody there believes that. 
I mean, they believe that he fasted and he prayed really and hungry. saw the way he was. <laughs> so I mean, that's why when he came out of there after six years, they tell the story down in the valley where he took me next, right. where you see Sujata and where she offered him his first food and thought he was a tree god because he looked all gnarled and skeleton. Huh. So there's a temple to her. There's also a the original place that sat over where her house was hmm. that was covered over, and it's all historical. And then you go to the actual uh, tree where he was for another three weeks, and this is the journey that he supposedly took that's so sacred to everybody around there before enlightenment. So hmm. you go to this tree okay. that is just gigantic. It is the most amazing tree I can say I've ever seen in Dongle or anywhere, and it's a banyan tree, but it's three trees in one. And it comes down and creates this huge cave. And, and so there's like three trees that have come up and combined into one tree. The most gnarled, gigantic thing you've ever seen. You can see the Cave of Enlightened Mountain, and you can see where he crossed the river, came, sat into the tree, and then he crosses over and goes to where Mahabodhi is. Hmm. So to try to capture all of this and what people believe and where Buddhism started, I had a picture in my mind of what this area looked like back when I was studying Bhutan and some of these areas, and see where it all happened. Mm -hmm. This is where Buddhism began. Clear back in the time of, like, Isaiah. I mean, this Buddha was right, in during yeah. the time of Isaiah. That's how long ago Very this all happened. Time. Changed the world. You've got so many Buddhists throughout, throughout India. Yeah. So a lot of people, and a lot of people don't know that, that Buddhism started in India. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So here it is. Here, here's where it started. I did get to go in and see the tree and see the temple. And they've got the tree all gated off. You can't get up to that tree. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's pretty special. In fact, you can barely see. They don't want anybody carving it. their initials in the tree. No. <laughs> that would be a deep, Spring deep Spring roundup on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can go around all the sides of it. You can kind of look in, peek in. You can right. get up close and look at it. It's real hard to get it on film. You know, I got some shots and some pictures of the tree itself and then the gate around it. So it's, so hard. it's a big, big, big tree. It's it's pretty good good size tree, so like but nothing a, special. You know? Like a saber tree, or bigger than that, or it's not as big as you would think. Um, I don't know what to compare it to. It's not not anything real special, honestly. It's just there. That's the tree, and it's so only the trees they have in north uh, in northern California. Not huge. No, 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 not like six, not like those. No, not okay. like that. And the banyan trees aren't that big around either. This would be just one tree. So pretty amazing. Would you like for world missions to be fresh and exciting in your home? Here at Final Frontiers, we work hard to produce a full-color magazine report with inspiring stories, important global facts, and missions opportunities and updates every quarter throughout the year. You can sign up for your copy at finalfrontiers.world. Your inquiries and comments are important to us. If you have questions or subject matter you would like to have others on this show, please visit us at finalfrontiers.world. To be a truly successful missionary, is it necessary to have a degree in missions? Think of those you consider to be the five greatest missionaries of all time. If you're a student of the New Testament and history, your list may include names like the Apostle Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Hudson Taylor, William Carey, David Brainerd, David Livingston, Adoniram Judson, James O. Frazier, and Henry Martin. Probably all of these men attended seminary, but it is likely that none of them took any courses in missions. Theology and hermeneutics, yes, but missions, probably not. So how could they be considered great if they didn't have a scholastic foundation in missions? The answer is profoundly simple. You can learn about missions in a classroom, but you will only learn how to do missions on the field by actually doing it. You can learn about aviation, auto mechanics, or welding in a classroom, but without experience, you'll never get hired. That's why most professions have apprenticeships. Next time you have an operation, do you want just a highly educated surgeon or one with years of experience as well? For the past 50 years in missions, Americans have deviated from the philosophy of get some training first. Our missionaries go directly to the field with no real apprenticeship at all. Thankfully, being a pastor still requires having some hands-on experience. Imagine if your pastor had no experience pastoring before he took the job. That's why most start out as assistant pastors or youth pastors. The title should come only after the tutelage. 
But in missions, no. We send out young families with no experience to a strange land and expect them to both survive and thrive. No wonder nearly half of all missionaries quit in their first three years. But if they are not to blame, at least they try. The fault is with the sending churches who send out a novice to do what a veteran would struggle to accomplish. There's a reason why all coaches insist, if you don't come to the practices, you don't get to play in the game. I'm John Nelms. To learn more about missions, order a copy of my book, The Great Omission, on our website at finalfrontiers.org. Welcome to Biographies, where we read you the original letters sent in from Final Frontiers church planters all over the earth. These short stories are dictated by John Nelms, who dearly hopes you enjoy and find inspiration from these initial hundred and testimonies of national missionaries in their own words. Remember to check this episode's show notes for a more in-depth video link of the story told to you today. Welcome back to our biographies. We want to talk to you today about a brother in Kenya named Jack Kamundia Tukinde. Go to finalfrontiers.world and you can learn more about him. This brother is one of the poorest preachers that we have in Africa. Let me start with his testimony. He says, before I knew Christ, I involved myself with worthless works pleasing the flesh. One day while visiting a church with my friend, I became burdened about my situation. And the following week, I accepted Christ as my Savior. My life changed. I started loving my wife, and shortly thereafter, seeing the changes in my life, she too accepted Christ. We are happily married now with three children of our own and two orphan children that we have taken into our home. And let me stop and say that's why our Touch a Life program is so important. These preachers are so poor that we're asking you to support them, and yet they're taking in orphans off the street because they can't bear to see them starve to death. But if you'd support some of these children that you see on our Touch a Life website, touchalife.world or tal.world, some of these preachers or some of these children being supported will relieve the financial burden of these preachers. So consider that, would you? He goes on and he says, I'm a member of the Maasai tribe, but I also minister to the Miru tribe. I speak English a little, but I'm fluent in Maasai, Swahili, and Kikuyu. My family needs are $180 monthly. And I receive a salary from my church of almost, are you ready for this? It's going to blow your way. $7 a month. I also work sweeping the house of another man. He pays me $4 monthly. So my income is almost $11 each month. This, of course, hinders me in my service to the Lord. It is not that my members are unfaithful in their tithe. It's just that they are poor and suffer as we do. The house we live in is made of mud, smeared with cow dung on the walls for, as a plaster. Uh, the roof is made with grass, and the house has two rooms. To help with milk and income, we raise a few goats. Your help will be such a blessing to my family, and I want to thank you in advance for what the Lord leads you to do for us. Now, I want you to know that Brother Josh Martin, who went over there recently and visited Kenya and filmed these guys, when his mom learned of this situation, she sent an offering and put a tin roof on their house. So that's a real blessing for them now. But let me tell you what he's done. The application I just read you, or the biography, was written in 2003. Now, 13 years later, we find that he has led 843 people to Christ, uh, baptized 204 of them. He has evangelized in 25 villages and he has started 18 churches. So this is a good guy. Thanks so much. God bless. You've been listening to the Final Frontiers radio show, funded by sponsors like you. Thank you so much for joining us. Through the funding of national and native preachers, we endeavor to effectively advance the gospel where it has never been preached before. If you want more information, visit www.finalfrontiers.world. That's finalfrontiers.world.